has reached a point in his progress where he needs to take serious account of where he is and whither he is going. This day has come much earlier than I thought it would. I wrote in 1940 a book called Dusk to Dawn, in which I sought to record our situation in a period of change. And I expected that period to last for another 50 years. But the Second World War and the rise of socialism and communism has hastened the event. And we are definitely approaching now a time when the American Negro will become in law equal in citizenship to other Americans. There is much hard work yet to be done before the Negro becomes a voter, before he has equal rights in education, and before he can claim complete civil and social equality in this nation. Yet this situation is in sight, and it brings not as many assume an end to the so-called Negro problems, but the beginning of even more difficult problems of race and culture. Because we must now ask ourselves, when we become equal American citizens, what will be our aims and ideals? And what will we have to do with the selecting of these aims and ideals? Are we to assume that we will simply adopt the ideals of Americans and become what they are or want to be? And that we will have in this process, no ideals of our own. That would mean that we would cease to be Negroes as such and become white in action, if not completely in color. We would take our culture from white Americans, doing as they do and thinking as they think. Manifestly, this would not be satisfactory. Physically, it would mean that we would be integrated with Americans, losing, first of all, the physical evidence of color and hair and racial type. We would lose our memory of Negro history and of those racial peculiarities with which we have been long associated. We would cease to acknowledge any greater tie with Africa than with England or Germany. We would not try to develop Negro music and art and literature as distinctive and different, but allow it to be further degraded as it is today. We would always, if possible, marry lighter hued people so as to have children who are not identified with the Negro race, and thus solve our racial problem in America by committing racial suicide. More or less clearly, this possibility has been in the minds of Negroes in the past, although not assented to by all. Some have stated it and welcomed it. Others have simply assumed that this development was in inevitable and therefore that nothing could be done about it. This is the reason that my Pan-African movement, which began in 1900 when I cooperated with a meeting in London, and which was definitely started in 1919 in the first Pan-African Congress. I could get but little support or cooperation from American Negroes. Most of them resented it as being a sort of back to Africa movement. Others simply said we have enough problems in America 
without taking on the insoluble problems of Africa. Today, when the African people are themselves rising to settle their own problems and are in the peculiar, we are in the peculiar position of being a group of persons of equal descent with some education, with intelligence, who not only cannot help the Africans, but in many cases do not want to. Any statement of our desire to develop American Negro culture, to keep our own ties with colored peoples, to remember our past, is being regarded as racism. I, for instance, who have devoted my life to efforts to break down racial problems, racial barriers, and being accused of desiring to emphasize differences of race. This has a certain element of truth. As I have said before, and as I repeat, I am not fighting to settle the question of racial equality in America by the process of getting rid of the Negro race, not producing black children, forgetting the slave trade and slavery, and the struggle for emancipation forgetting abolition, and especially of ignoring the whole cultural history of Africans in the world. No, what I have been fighting for, and am still fighting, is the possibility of black folk and black cultural patterns existing in America without discrimination and on terms of equality. If we take this attitude, we have got to do so consciously and deliberately. This brings up a number of different, of difficult problems which we will have to solve and make definite preparation for such solutions. Take for instance, the current problem of the education of our children. By the law of the land today, they should be admitted to the public schools. If and when they are admitted to these schools, certain things will inevitably follow. Negro teachers will become rarer, and in many cases quite disappear. Negro children will be instructed in public schools and taught under unpleasant, if not discouraging, circumstances. Even more largely than, than today, they will fall out of school, cease to enter high school, and fewer and fewer will go to college. Theoretically, Negro universities will disappear. Negro history will be taught less or not at all. And as in so many cases in the past, Negroes will remember their white or Indian ancestors and quite forget their black forebears. Read, for instance, the autobiography of John Mercer Langston. To some folk, this type of argument would lead to the conclusion that we ought to refuse to enter high schools or to clamor for unsegregated schools. In other words, that we ought to give up the fight against color discrimination. I want, however, to emphasize that this not only is unnecessary, but impossible. We must accept equality or die. What we must also do is to lay down a line of thought and action which will accomplish two things. The utter disappearance of color discrimination in American life and the preservation of African history and culture as a valuable contribution to modern civilization as it was to medieval and ancient civilization. To do this is not easy. It calls for intelligence, cooperation, and careful planning. It would meet head-on the baffling difficulties that face us today. 
Here, for instance, is the boy who says simply, he's not going to school. His treatment in the schools, even if admitted, is such that it does not attract him. Moreover, the boy who does enter the integrated school and gets on reasonably well does not always become a useful member of our group. Negro children educated in such schools, in northern colleges, often know nothing of Negro history, know nothing of Negro leadership, and doubt if there ever have been Negro leaders in Africa, the West Indies, and the United States who equal white folk. Some even become ashamed of themselves and their hope. They regard the study of Negro biography and the writing of Negro literature as a vain attempt to pretend that Negroes are really the equals of whites. That may be often the point of view of those of our children who are educated in white schools. There are going to be schools which do not discriminate against colored people. And the number is going to increase, slowly in the present, but rapidly in the future, until long before the year 2000, there will be no school segregation on the basis of race. The deficiency in knowledge of Negro history and culture, however, will remain, and this danger must be met, or else American Negroes will disappear. Their history and their culture will be lost. Their connection with the rising African world will be impossible. What then can we do? Or should we try to do? Negro parents and Negro parent teachers associations will have, at least temporarily, to take on and carry the burden which they have hitherto left to the public schools. The child in the family, in specific organizations, or in social life, must learn, but he does not learn in school, until the public schools become what they should be. Negro history must be taught for many critical years by parents, in clubs, by lecture courses, by a new le Negro literature which Negroes must write and buy. This must be done systematically for the whole Negro race in the United States and elsewhere. This is going to take time and money and is going to call for racial organization. Negro communities, Negro private schools will and must be organized and supported. This racial organization, however, will be voluntary and not compulsory. It will not be discriminatory. It will be carried on according to definite object and ideal and will be open to all who share this ideal. And of course, that ideal must always be in accord with the greater ideals of mankind. But what American Negroes must remember is that voluntary organization for great ends is far different from compulsory segregation for evil purposes. Especially and first, there has got to be a deliberate effort made toward the building of Negro families. Our family organization has been left almost entirely to chance. How, when, and where the Negro boy and girl is going to meet and meet has been given no organized thought, and in many cases the whole process has been deliberately ignored. Beyond that comes the primary question of what a Negro child is to do with life. This has been taught only incidentally and accidentally in economics or in ethics, outside and beyond school, in the family and in religious organizations. The Negro race has got to impress upon its children certain fundamental facts, 
the normal human being must work and work regularly to supply his wants, such legitimate wants as food and clothes and shelter. In addition, there must be creative activities, such as we understand under art and literature. And then there must be systematic recreation for health, for normal satisfying of the sexual instinct, for social contact, for sympathy, friendship, love, and sacrifice. In this matter of life vocation, we Negroes have got to inculcate in the minds of our children many objects to which white America today is not only opposed, but bitterly fights. Why should a man be a physician? Not simply to cure disease and treat accident, but to prevent disease and protect health. Today, most physicians, white and black, have no time for this. This is the object of social medicine and is practiced in most of Europe, both Western and Eastern, and in China. While the American Medical Association fights with huge funds every effort to bring government-supported social medicine to the service of the people. Why should a man study law but to see that justice is done, and yet the chief service and huge pay of lawyers today in America is to guide wealthy and powerful corporations in breaking the law and in putting on the statute books laws which discriminate against the poor. Our jails are bursting with prisoners who have no one to defend them even when they have committed no crime. Why should a man become a dentist? Not to extract teeth, but to prevent teeth from becoming diseased. The schools of the socialist and communist world are doing this. Our schools have scarcely begun. What is the object of business? Americans say profits. And in order to make profits large, we are spending $50,000 million a year for war. This war is carried on to make exploitation of land and labor possible, to steal materials and cheap laborers. When northern Rhodesia sells her copper for $36 million, she pays nothing for the land out of which the copper comes, and only half a million dollars for the black labor that mines it. Twenty million dollars goes to the investors in Europe and America, and the rest to machines and white European labor. The object of business should not be profit, but service. The service of collecting raw material, of processing it for consumption, and bringing it to the consumer. For this service, wages should be paid. But vast, unearned income should not be given to the man who steals the land and takes from the laborer that which is his due. This is increasingly the belief of civilized countries, but it is not the belief of much of Western Europe nor of white America. The correct attitude toward vocations then must be taught increasingly in our schools. Yet today, in American schools and colleges, white and black, economics, social science, money and finance are not properly taught. And especially, most schools and colleges are afraid to teach the remedies which socialism and communism propose for better distribution of work and income or to tell how the larger part of the civilized world is adopting these methods of accomplishing these things. I pause to remark 
that your program committee has shown positive genius in not even mentioning once the word socialism in this program. Yet, socialists say most of the money which we pay for telephone service, for electrical devices, and for power goes to make a few individuals rich and not for paying good wages or making these services cheap. Insurance is a great invention designed to place the cost of death and accident on the whole community instead of having it ruin the individual. Here is no place for private property. The premium should pay for the loss and the wages of, manu of management. But today, above this, individuals in insurance make millions and private insurance companies control national money and credit. Evidently, insurance is a public function and not a private enterprise. The great American world, of which we for centuries have been trying to become a part, and which has risen to be one of the most powerful nations in the world, is today losing its influence. And that American Negroes do not realize. There was a time when, as leader of a new democracy, as believers in a new tolerance in religion, as a people basing their life on equality of opportunity in the ownership of land and property, the United States stood first in the minds of mankind. That day has passed. I took a trip recently that lasted a year. I had already traveled widely. I had been to Europe 15 times. I had been to Asia. I had circled the world. Then for 10 years, I was imprisoned in the confines of the United States by the unauthorized dictum of those who were ruling. From 1950 to 1958, I was not allowed to travel abroad. The reason was that I had cooperated with millions of men who wanted war to cease. Even here, my action had been simply to tell Americans what was being done by other countries to promote peace. For this, I was accused of being the agent of foreign peacemakers and ordered to admit this or go to jail. It cost me over $30,000 to defend myself in court against this absurd accusation. This sum I and my wife had to put Big from the public, traveling from state to state. The court threw the case out of court for lack of proof. Despite this, I was refused a passport to travel abroad until the Supreme Court finally decided that the Department of State had no legal ground to refuse me a passport. Paul Rosen, Rosen who for 10 years had been deprived of a livelihood for equally baseless reasons, he and myself and a few others were given passports. I and my wife went abroad to Great Britain and Holland, to France and Czechoslovakia, to Sweden and Germany, to the Soviet Union and to the Chinese Republic. It was the most astonishing trip I have ever had. It radically changed my whole point of view. I saw first that America and its actions since the First World War was thoroughly condemned by the civilized world, that no other country was so disliked and hated. And for fear of our wealth and power, there were certain countries like the British and the Dutch who restrained their expressions of dislike. Nevertheless, 
they did not like America or Americans. That the French could hardly mention America without calling them dirty. That the people of Czechoslovakia and Germany blamed America for the cruelties which they had suffers, suffered and for the difficulties which they were facing. That the 200 million people in the Soviet Union regarded Americans as their greatest threat and that the 680 millions of China hate America with perfect hatred for treating them as subhuman. Outside, outside this matter of feeling was my discovery that the world was going socialist, that most people in the world, in Europe, Asia, and even Africa, were either socialistic or communistic. No matter what our attitude is towards socialism and communism, no matter how we judge the teachings of Karl Marx, we must face the truth. Not only black, but white Americans must know, and they do not know. The news gathering agencies and peri periodicals of opinion in the United States are deliberately deceiving the people with regard to the rest of the world. For a long time, they have spread the belief that communism is a crime or a conspiracy, and that anyone, either taking part or even examining conditions in the socialist lands, is a self-conscious criminal or a fool. For decades now, they have made Americans believe that communism is a failure, that the Russian people and the people of Hungary and Czechoslovakia and the Balkans are prisoners enslaved in thought of action, that communism only needed our help to fall in ruins, that China is trying to conquer all Asia. Despite all this propaganda, we are beginning now to realize some things that are clear, that the Soviet Union has made color prejudice illegal, that she has a system of education probably the best in the world and far superior to ours, that science there is forging ahead of anything that we have, and that the people are not prisoners and are not asking our help in order to revolt. They are progressing at a rate superior to us in art, literature, and general happiness. I spent six weeks in China. I was treated with a courtesy that I had known nowhere else in the world. And I was convinced that here is a colored people who in happiness and knowledge would outstrip the world before the dawn of the next century. The work of China today is a miracle of success. What we Americans want is freedom to know the truth and the right, to think and to act as seems wisest to us under the democratic process. And what we have to remember is that in the United States, democracy has almost disappeared. There is no use deceiving ourselves in that respect. Half the citizens of the United States do not even go to the polls. Most Negroes are disfranchised. It is the considered opinion of social scientists in America that the election which made Dwight Eisenhower president cost over $100 million and perhaps $200 million. Why does America need such an election fund? A democratic election does not need it, and the United States needed and used it only for bribing voters directly or indirectly, or frightening men from thinking. This is what the rulers of the United States demand, and those rulers, instead of being free individuals, are organized corporations who suppress freedom by monopolizing wealth. If all this is true, it must be taught to our youth. It must be taught by teachers and instructors and professors. And in this case, we must face the fact that these teachers may lose their jobs. 
They can only be supported and employed in the bulk, by the bulk of Americans, the bulk of American Negroes, support institutions which teach this. If the Negro or white colleges are going to depend on the gifts of the rich for support, they cannot teach the truth. If they are supported tomorrow, Negroes must give not a tenth but a quarter of their income to support education and social organization, and teachers must sacrifice themselves to the last penny. This impoverishment of the truth seekers can be avoided by eventually making the state bear the burden of education, and this is socialism. We must vote then for this kind of socialism. We began this in the New Deal, and we were stopped. But in Europe and Asia, and also in Africa, socialism and communism are spreading. Socialism will grow in the United States if we restore the democracy of which we have boasted so long and done so little. Here is where Negroes may and must lead. This is my sincere belief, arrived at after long study, travel, observation, and thought. Many disagree with me, and that is their right. They have every right, to every opportunity, to express their belief, and you cannot escape listening to them, and should not, if you could. <coughs> but they have no right to demand that you refuse to listen to the worldwide voice of socialism, or to threaten you with punishment if you do listen. This is the first right of democracy, the right to listen. I appeal to the members of this organization, first to teach the truth as they see it, even if they lose their jobs. 